So welcome back to everyone to our second session for this series of bite-sized corrosion. As you well know, we are exploring some of the hidden dangers of cathodic protection. And today we're going to be exploring a discussion on the cloak and dagger aspects of cathodic protection. Now, you probably think I'm a little overdramatic, and I can be, but I hope by the end of today's conversation, you'll see where we get that from, the secret aspects that sadly go on behind the scenes with cathodic protection. Today, I'm really delighted to be welcoming Diana Katsky to our discussion. Diana is a well-renowned pipeline engineer within the water sector, and I have had the great pleasure of working with her over several years. Now, I know she worked at Rand Water for many years, and she's now an engineer with Leso Engineering Consultants. And I've watched Diana fight corrosion misconceptions over the years, particularly with her work in revising pipeline coating specifications. And I know we're going to have a great discussion today. So a warm welcome to you, Diana. Thank you, Vanessa. Yes, um, during my tenure in rainwater, I was more in the civil design department, went over to civil construction, then moved over to pipeline construction, and then eventually ended up at pipeline design. And like you said, I'm now with Lisa Consulting and I'm still performing the same duties. I've also had the pleasure of um, working with SITWITH, revising SABS uh, 1200. And basically all of this was based on the dangers of the infrastructure that gets damaged, which is a risk for your equipment, people and the supply. Thank you, Diana. And yes, your work is very valuable. And I know that that will have a benefit to the industry for years to come. And you're right. One of the hidden dangers associated with cathodic protection, sadly, is the danger associated with the loss of cathodic protection infrastructure due to theft and vandalism. And I guess the most obvious thing that we lose is the power supply. Yes. And the est owners, they know you. we've been having endless, endless problems with it, like the CPU that gets vandalized, the TRUs, it's just a rock. <laughs> I've got a few photographs here that are probably worth exploring for a little bit um, regarding the uh, cathodic protection infrastructure that gets damaged. And, and this is the absolute tragedy. So in this sequence of photographs, we can see that there was a real attempt to protect the infrastructure. You can see in the background, it, there was a barbed wire um, fence, then a palisade fence, and then the TRU was housed in a concrete um, building. And despite that, you can see that this was completely ransacked. On the floor, you can see that the, the cables were cut, the rectifier itself was completely stripped out. And whilst the damage was severe, probably hundreds of thousands of rands, the, the net value of what was stolen is almost insignificant. Because the housing became a risk, uh, transformer rectifiers were then housed in more secure concrete bunker style, and even these were subject to vandalism. Uh, here we can see it was completely destroyed. <laughs> the front was completely taken off. And you can see in the background, um, in, the, in this picture here, you can see the same pole that we have uh, where they've taken the, the external power supply as well. So that isn't particularly helpful in terms of keeping power to the cathodic protection system. This photograph is just an indication of how wily they can be. In the background behind this direction from where this photograph is taken is the road. So driving along the road, it looked like this was, was intact. But coming around the, the backside of the cabinet, you can see that they've spent hours, probably days, chipping away until they gained access. And in an attempt to kind of reinforce even further, there was, there's been a, a move towards these uh, concrete cubes, uh, two by two by two, with a safe door on them. And even in this example, there's vandalism. And we had a little chuckle about this because the vandals who attacked this, you can see here how neatly they cut through. I mean, their workmanship was profound, <laughs> although intensely frustrating 
from our side. But rectifiers aren't the only thing that have problems. Let's face it. Yeah, from our side, um, uh, we found that, you know, without the uh, test points, test posts on the pipeline where you can measure what's going on with your pipeline, it created so much frustration because now you don't know whether your pipe is protected or not. And you end up like worrying about whether your pipe is compromised. And while the people do not understand, once your pipe is compromised and you've got metal loss, you end up with a leak. With that leak, you end up having water losses and you can't that provide makes us all grumpy. service. Yeah. That is so true. One of the, the misconceptions about cathodic protection is that it can restore the status of the pipeline. And, and that is definitely not the case. Once that metal is lost, that metal is lost. And so the point of having the cathodic protection system there is to try not to lose any of the metal. My picture gallery extends to some of the, the test posts as well. Um, and here we've seen also some, some pretty sad situations. One of the challenges with the test posts is they're remotely located. And although in the urban areas, you get attack on test posts because they are visible and there are people who can um, have perhaps evil intent toward them. In the rural areas, they, they get vandalized because they are so remote. So they're not being checked. They're not in the common site. You can see um, in this one example, you've got our test posts. The grass hasn't been maintained, the servitude hasn't been maintained, and, and that's something that the asset owners need to remember is important, but it's really hidden. Um, you know, here's the test post, you can see the grass is really high all around it. And when we came to this test post, the inside was completely stripped on either side of this. You can see other examples where uh, test posts have been breached and either just damaged um, as in the one on the left, or in fact stripped out completely. And in both situations, of course, you end up being unable to monitor your pipeline, which, which can also be a bit of a challenge. When they strip out the test posts, there's a tendency to cut the cables as low down as possible. Obviously, they're being stripped out because there's copper in them and the copper has a certain value on the market, but it's not helpful for reinstating them because this cable is actually too short to really do a decent cable repair. And now you've got additional costs and, and perhaps not a danger of the cathodic protection itself, but a danger of the financial danger associated with the repairs is also something that needs to be borne in mind and taken into consideration. And just like with the transformer rectifiers, it's been a lot of effort to try and make the test posts more vandal resistant, you can't say vandal proof, but try to find ways to minimize the risk. There was a move to put everything back inside the valve chambers. There's been a move to take it all outside of the valve chambers again. And, and there isn't a right or wrong answer. It's just what can we deal with at the moment? So these are just a couple of concrete bunker type test posts that um, have been vandalized galvanized uh, test posts that have been vandalized. And then even a, a valve chamber, which was used to house some of the test point material. And that lid has also been neatly chopped away, which again is just a nuisance and a challenge. And, and I know that from your side, you've tried really hard to find ways to redesign these. What are some of the things that, that you've done? Well, basically, at this design stage, you would go to a point where you actually do go the, the extra mile by doing vandal-resistant um, chambers, where it's either you over-design the chamber, you have thicker roof slabs. Like I said, you, you try and weld the, the chamber shut just to actually make sure that the chamber and the equipment, people can't get into the chamber. Yeah. And uh, obviously, the risk of that is that you now need heavy lifting equipment to get exactly. in, or hypothetically you do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you're not, we're not only protecting, I mean, I only speak with a cathodic protection head, um, 
but but obviously um, it would be vain of me to say uh, only my equipment needs to be protected you've got valves and and water meters and so on that need protecting yes because i've it's, it's horrendous what you can see i've seen once where a valve was the bolts were totally stripped and the only thing that kept that valve together was literally the fact that the the pipe and the valve was like still intact it was still in the same position but if anybody knocked the valve that valve could pop you know and the ramifications of that are are quite severe the the, the personal risk obviously loss of of the fluid but you know anyone in that chamber would be killed um, yes. and that's also quite quite scary that um, is very scary i just have a little bit of a, a sad but amusing story a couple of years ago now, uh, we were doing an inspection, um, routine monitoring inspection on a pipeline. And it was one of these chambers that engineers like you had designed with very heavy lids that needed a crane to lift them. But the vandals had managed to wedge open the chambers with a rock, as you can see in the corner here. And this gentleman had managed to climb inside. And when we arrived on site, he was still in the chamber. And it was a very quick thinking TLB operator who had accompanied us in order to remove the lid. Well, that was obviously no longer required, but he put the bucket of his TLB onto that lid so that the guy could not escape. Obviously, we've, we've blurred it now, but he was able to be apprehended. But he, he was quite upset that we had disturbed his work. And, and you know, he was hard at work stripping all the the valuable contents from this chamber, uh, which he thought was perfectly acceptable. Fortunately, law enforcement arrived eventually and uh, were able to um, remove him from the scene. But uh, although we chuckled about it, it's really sad that it's even happening. And I did a paper about it a couple of years ago at an international conference. And although some of the ingenuity that is typically South African in terms of vandalism, we're not alone in the world. Sadly, vandalism is a thing all over the place. Yeah, and it's actually all of us, it's our responsibility to try and service everybody and try and keep our equipment safe, have personal safety at the same time. And we all have to forge together. If anybody comes up with a better idea how to do this, I would love ideas, more ideas, because over designs is people tend to find a way. So maybe we should think like them and become <laughs> <laughs> and become vandalists to unvandalize <laughs> our there stuff. may be there may definitely be merit in that. I think one of the challenges that I see and the risk to the cathodic protection from vandalized infrastructure is that there's no longer a real and easy method to evaluate what the status is from a cathodic protection point of view. So if the test post has been destroyed, let's say in the first scenario, the rectifier is still operational because it's within this protected environment. We still can't verify that on the pipeline easily because our monitoring points, which are our easy access to the pipe are no longer there. And that for me is a risk because we don't know what's going on. And so we don't have a way of making sure that it's still okay, Jack, and not in a highly corrosive um, situation. Yes, and that leaves um, asset owners with the issue of whether my pipe, is it working? And it's it just, I don't have words anymore <laughs> for what to do. Yeah. And I think one of the things that pipeline owners like to do is to take their routine monitoring potentials and evaluate them and then see where the risks are in terms of uh, poor protection levels. And if you're not getting that information, I mean, when you've got a pipeline that's running consistently, say, for example, at minus one, but in one area, is uh, consistently, let's say, minus, minus 9 or even minus 850, that might be worthy of further investigation or um, possible additional intervention 
to reduce the risk in all likelihood is going through perhaps a, a water um, flay area or a um, protected wetland. And you want to know that so that you don't cause environmental damage. Um, we've been speaking about water pipes, but if that's a fuel pipe going through a wetland and the protection is borderline and we no longer know and we're no longer keeping an eye on it, we could be heading for a problem. And then I also think that one of the challenges with the, uh, with the infrastructure, of course, is, is when it goes wrong, then we do get a leak and then you don't provide, for example, water, which is, is really the mandate of the asset owner. Yes, and that, that is where, the, where people, I don't think the people understand the magnitude of, of that because everybody wants to go home. They will expect water from their tips. If we can't deliver the supply because of the large amount of water loss in, during your, your supply mandate, it's just, it makes, you, it makes me as an engineer feel that I'm, I'm not doing my job, you know? because my mandate is to supply the water, you know, and I'm sure now with, if you look at the environmental damage that I could mention, if, it, if it's fuel, I mean, the contamination that, that, that take, would take place there, it's even, I, I can't even comprehend that, you know. And I, and I think just um, in case we've painted the picture that that theft of the test post today means a leak in your pipe tomorrow, um, as we stated yesterday, this is not a quick process. The corrosion will occur, but it's not going to happen overnight. And so it often goes undetected, which in a sense in itself is also a hidden danger. So it could be five or six years between the destruction of the infrastructure before uh, the surface infrastructure, the cathodic protection infrastructure, before the pipe itself is compromised to the point of perforation. And so in that time, uh, we could have moved on from our positions in our companies, and the new people don't even know that there was a CP system, that this is an area of risk, and that also is a danger in that uh, in the future, they'll be reaping what we are sowing with the vandalism today. Yeah. I'm, I know of instances where the incidents happened within three months, not even now six that's years. Scary. <laughs> now that's scary and and it's probably um, aided and abated by stray currents I would imagine yes. but and, and that is a whole different topic and we've discussed stray currents in some of our previous episodes uh, so you're welcome to go back and have a look at those on either our teachable platform or on our YouTube portal so uh, yeah I think we could sadly talk about vandalism for an incredibly lengthy period it definitely is something that that everybody in the room today can start thinking about and thinking creatively, as Diana suggested earlier, how can we do this differently so that we can still protect our infrastructure uh, without compromising it completely? And one of the challenges that we need to deal with is that until we get our cathodic protection right, um, our steel infrastructure is, is compromised. And then there's often a, a recommendation or a request to use um, some of the plastics. And whilst they can be used, I think there are good engineering reasons to stay with steel, um, but there are also some significant challenges as we do so. So it is a, a risk um, and, and I think a very serious hidden danger of cathodic protection is when it's no longer there. So I think that also encourages asset owners to keep an eye on their infrastructure so that you know what is going on with it. Because I do think that that early intervention can also be beneficial. Well, I don't know if you've got any parting comments to make, um, Diana, in this regard. We are engineers. That means we need to think out of the box to win this battle. Thank you, absolutely. And it's so helpful. And thank you for giving us your perspective uh, on, on the vandalism issue. And I think certainly you've provided some food for thought.